good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, thanks for coming to today's episode of Live with Mighty Hive, which is titled, uh, The Future Begins in Q4, How a Q4 Amazon Strategy Sets the Stage for 2021 and Beyond. So we're going to be looking today about how this Q4 is going to be different than any Q4 that's ever happened before, really. Um, and while the opportunities there are pretty obvious, certainly if there's more sales, there's um, lots more opportunity to capture those. But I think we're going to spend even a little bit more time today discussing why in a, a successful Q4 is going to lead to some long-term benefits um, going into uh, next year. I'm your host. My name is Adam Remsen. Um, I'm the Director of Content Marketing at Mighty Hive. We are an S4 company. And I'm joined today uh, by John Giorso, who is the founder and CEO of Orca Pacific, which is now an, also an S4 company, as a matter of fact. A little bit about Live with Mighty Hive. Um, we are designed to be short, informative, packed chats where uh, brand marketers and digital analytics and programmatic experts come on to share their knowledge and expertise on very specific subjects. Um, we tend to be less slides and more talk, and we're certainly gonna get into the interview portion of this later with John. And, but our goal ultimately is that you uh, leave this 30-minute um, talk with a little bit more knowledge than uh, when you came into it. Um, we invite your ideas for topics and subjects. Um, we, you can send those to live at mightyhive.com. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to hear more about future episodes of uh, Live with Mighty Hive. Um, and we're going to send you those two links right now via the chat. So don't bother writing them down. We make it easy for you here. Um, they should be coming through to you right now. Um, a little bit about Mighty Hive. Um, Mighty Hive is a new breed of media consultancy. We are a global leader in advanced marketing and advertising technologies, and Mighty Hive provides consulting and services in the areas of um, media operations and training, data strategy, and analytics. Um, you can see uh, a few of our esteemed clients to the right, and you can learn more about uh, us by going to mightyhive.com. Uh, just one last housekeeping slide here. The recording and slides of this are going to be available later and we'll email you uh, them. So don't worry about taking notes, just sit back, soak it all in, allow your inquisitive mind to get to work. And when your inquisitive mind comes up with questions, use the Q&A widget at the bottom uh, and send us those questions because we will have time at the end to answer them. Uh, and uh, certainly we'll try to get to them all. Um, now, before I introduce John, there are a couple of things that I want to share just to put a little bit of context around this conversation. Now, a lot of us have already heard about how COVID-19 um, affected shopping habits, both online and offline. Um, in this chart, you can see this is a, this is a year over year by the week, um, starting in January in terms of the uh, um, growth of online shopping. So, you can see that in uh, mid to late March there, we had a public school shutdown in New York and California, and that precipitated a pretty predictive um, spike. Um, we had a stay at home order. And when that got extended uh, to the middle of May, we saw another spike. Um, but things started to level off a little bit. Um, we started to hit phase one and two and three of the reopenings. Um, certainly in New York, and um, that you know eased off things, and and it made it so that it looked like people were accepting that online shopping was just how they were going to get things, um, and they, um, as a result, you know things started to level off, and they weren't just hoarding toilet paper; they were buying just about everything. So then, if you look at January to March, and you look at late June to the end of the year that wave looks kind of the same, up and down, but much, much less spikes. That is true, but there's one big key difference is that the year over year growth is much higher. If you look at the mean average of January to March, 
it's in the teens. You know, you've got some zero growth. You've got some, uh, you know, 25% growth, but it's coming in in the teens. If you look at uh, late June to the end of the year, it's closer to 50%. So this suggests that more people are adopting online shopping as a way of life. And if we go to the next slide, the prognosticators agree. Um, look at the, this is this slide, just to walk you through it here, takes a look at what they're guessing the growth in uh, pen, the e-commerce penetration is going to be. And the dotted black line is what it was before COVID, uh, for anyone knew about COVID. And the 34% is what it's projected to be. So people, you know, these are numbers from the Census Bureau and reputable sources. So it's really looking like this is going to be a bit of a new way of life. And again, if you look at this from 2000 to 2020 almost, it took 20 years to get 10% penetration, but we're going to more than triple that in the next 10 years. So, um, I mean, to me, that kind of says it all, really. <laughs> I mean, it's the new normal, and uh, we're all just going to um, get used to it. Um, so, at the center of all of this um, is our guest today and Amazon. Amazon, um, you know, we're seeing ridiculous growth there and it reflects a lot of the numbers that, um, that I just showed you and, and John can get into those um, a little bit later because John's firm, Orca Pacific, um, he's the founder and CEO, specializes in Amazon marketing tools for his clients. And we're gonna discuss a lot of the factors that I mentioned to, uh, before, but also we're gonna mention some others. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what's gonna make this Q4 season so special. John is also among the newest members of the S4 family. Congratulations, John, on that merger. Um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about um, your company and how it fits into um, S4 so well. Yeah, um, so Orca Pacific is a full service agency with an exclusive focus on Amazon. We're here in Seattle. We have about 50 people on staff. We've been doing this about a decade. And uh, we work with consumer product brands really across categories. Um, we work with startups, uh, brands that are relatively new to the platform or brand new, all the way up to you know, Fortune 500 enterprise clients. And we offer services really in every facet of the platform. So marketing, content, advertising, backend, operational issues, strategy, et cetera. Uh, I think it's uh, mostly an incremental capability for S4. Uh, S4 offers a, a huge amount of uh, kind of uh, new opportunities for Orca to expand. So I think it's really kind of a, a win-win uh, relationship. It seems to be. And we love you guys so much already. So, you know, it's all working out. Um, let's see, you know, the, you guys also put out a lot of content. Um, the, uh, you've got a learning portal. Um, you also have a podcast series as well. And we're going to chat those links to anyone who wants to learn more about Amazon uh, marketing as well and, and what Orca Pacific does. And we'll get a little bit, we're going to get into what Orca Pacific does a little bit as we sort of discuss this, um, this amazing Q4 that's coming up. You're also an avid kite surfer, it turns out. Is that as fun as it looks? It is as fun as it looks. It's, uh, it's really a pain to learn, but, uh, but once you're over the hump, it's, it's, it's super fun. You basically just get to fly across the top of the water under your own power. It's, pretty great so i'm gonna sound like an idiot right now like are you so that means you're a freestyler not a free rider so there's yeah so there's a lot of different disciplines in kiting um i am uh i would say free ride which is basically just you do whatever you want cruise around and then surf um is something i've been getting into more lately so actually riding uh surfable waves but with uh with a kite powering you which is kind of a whole different uh new dimension to the sport oh yeah yeah. Did you ever surf before? Uh, I mean, I, I kind of picked up surfing along with kiting. You know, it's uh, because I live in Seattle. It's a kind of vacation sport. So I, I, I haven't progressed as fast as I would have liked. But, uh, but you know, it's whenever I get to do it, it's, it's, uh, it's a blast. So It doesn't seem to be happening much in Brooklyn. So I'm going to have to wait till I move. I'm yeah. Afraid. Yeah. Um, so listen, we, you know, John and I want to get to know the audience a little bit uh, as well. So we want to launch a poll and we really just want to know how much uh, 
gross annual sales revenue you're generating on Amazon right now. Um, so we're launching that poll right now. Um, please, you know, have a look at it. Um, uh, answer your answer questions and we will circle back to it in a minute or two. Um, but I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to John um, because uh, I'd like to hear his perspective on Amazon a bit um, and what's happening right now and, and what's sort of, you know, this kind of growth that it's been seeing. So John, maybe you can walk us through this slide. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this slide is going to be unsurprising to a lot of people, uh, but I think there's a few interesting call outs here. So obviously e-commerce has benefited uh, from COVID. Can't leave your house. You're going to buy more things online. So we all, we all know that. Um, I think what's really interesting here is that Q2, if you look at historically, Q4 is by far the biggest quarter. Things reset a bit in Q1 and then kind of grow again from there organically. Uh, Q2 of this year was bigger than Q4 of last year, which is obviously very abnormal for Amazon. And then the growth rate has significantly accelerated on the platform. So um, Q2 was panic buying. We'll get into that a little bit because that was something that we'll probably never see happen again. Let's, let's at least hope so. Um, uh, but I think there's a longer term shift to online purchasing, obviously Amazon being a big beneficiary of that. Um, that has a lot more staying power beyond just kind of the, I'm quarantined for three weeks and I'm going to buy, you know, a year's worth of toilet paper activity. Now, also what we're not seeing, what we might not see again in this coming Q4 is Prime Day, which is going to happen in Q4. So that has a lot to do with why this Q4 is going to be really unique. But I heard that they're anticipating $10 billion of sales in two days on Prime Day. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think the way that we really have to look at Prime Day this year is it's, it's early start to holiday shopping. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just pure and simple. Call it whatever you want, right? But like Prime Day is a branding thing. Great. Um, Prime Day is not what Prime Day usually is this year. Usually it's a, it's a, a holiday uh, uh, kind of that Amazon invented in the middle of summer where retail sales are historically kind of at their worst spot. People are doing the least shopping they ever do in, in July and August, except for back to school. Um, and now it's really an early start to holiday shopping. And it's actually forced the entire retail industry to now start doing their deals earlier as well. Uh, because there's a fear that Amazon will basically kind of capture all of the, the bargain hunters and then there'll be nothing left uh, for Black Friday and, and Cyber Monday. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's going to sort of suck the wind out of it a bit. But it, it does it does froth up the uh, the consumers, doesn't it? I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of buying that just happens because it's Prime Day and there's a certain amount of it that's going to pull from Black Friday. But but they I think I saw that last Q4 on Amazon was something like six point something billion and this one's going to be almost 10 billion. So something, certainly Amazon is, is going to reap most of the benefits of this, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're setting the narrative yeah. uh, in the industry, which is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gosh. So this actually, this slide um, is a little bit about how you see the world um, in terms of shopping behavior and shifting over time. Maybe you can just walk us through this. Yeah, so this is a this is a framework that we put together when COVID first hit the U.S. So I, I guess like in March, and um, while it's dragged out uh, longer than maybe we anticipated, I think the framework still stands. And so basically, it's this kind of general framework of three phases. Phase one was this immediate sort of lockdown, panic buying phase. We all lived through that. I don't have to explain it back to anybody. We know it happened. Massive spikes in consumables. Um, Interestingly, on Amazon, there was such a massive increase in volume that Amazon had to uh, uh, basically triage what they were able to sell. So they split their selection, their product selection between what they called essential and non-essential. Essential was basically anything you needed to kind of survive, right? So food, beverage, um, uh, health and personal care, pet, so pet food, um, and then everything else uh, discretionary was uh, pushed into a realm where um, uh, it would be, uh, you know, 30-day delivery windows. They weren't taking in new inventory. Um, Adam, can you see me all right? I look frozen. Yeah, you do look frozen. 
can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Well, I will, um, I'll keep rolling. Um, so, uh, so anyway, phase two, um, was, was really, uh, kind of this sustained shift that I would say we're in the middle of, of phase two right now. So, uh, phase two basically is, um, this kind of, uh, uh, new normal, if you will, kind of moving to, um, uh, uh, you know, behaviors that people have adopted because they still don't really want to go to stores. Um, they're worried about it, et cetera. Uh, we've seen Amazon really benefit from this. And then phase three, and this is something we're sort of projecting out, is this general idea that behavioral shifts to e-commerce, even though they were essentially forced on people because they're not going to go to stores for very acute reasons, once there's a vaccine, once we're sort of done with COVID for the most part, as a society, we believe that there's going to be a huge amount of stickiness in e-commerce and specifically Amazon adoption, which basically is going to set a new paradigm for the industry, um, you know, effectively accelerating it about five years in, you know, maybe a, a 15 month period. Which is mind boggling. Um, uh, I mean, certainly the trends were always, were already going in that direction, but I mean, it, it's a little weird for me to think about it because like, I do so much online shopping that it's weird for me to think that uh, it only has a 10% penetration, right? But um, so when you, you see those numbers, like, wow, we got a long way to go. But this is going to, it looks like it's going to be a game changer. But for those that maybe, um, you know, think that, I don't know, like, there are a lot of people who agree with you, right? And that the charts we just showed before, the same way, um, certainly even our, you know, uh, Sir Martin Sorrell, our, our, um, our, chairman of our board agrees with you as well. Um, but what, are, what do you think, are, what indicators are you seeing? I mean, I just like to hear maybe what your, pr your perspective is on this, because you're coming in from, from the side over there on, on Amazon. Like, why, what are you seeing that really, that you're sure that it's not just going to drop back down to the way it was before? Yeah. So um, what we've seen uh, is basically once the sort of panic buying was done, um, sales level off at, uh, at a, a, in a position that were dramatically in a lot of cases higher than what we would have expected kind of organic growth to represent. Mm -hmm. So basically once consumers may not be buying as much stuff, they're not buying six months worth of toilet paper in, in two weeks anymore. They're buying the normal amount of toilet paper, but um, they're doing a lot more of that purchasing online and that has not stopped uh, or subsided in any significant way. So we've basically seen kind of this huge spike and then a plateau that is much more uh, uh, significant than it would have otherwise been. Uh, we see that in all of the different metrics and KPIs we look at around kind of real time consumer behavior on the platform. So, you know, you can look backwards and look at Q2 sales and go, oh, wow, that's crazy. But what we're seeing is, you know, we're looking at last week numbers and, you know, this week numbers, and that trend is not stopping or slowing down. And I think people can go to stores now, right? Like they, in most like places, you can go to a store, you can, you can do that. So it's, it's less representative of a forced behavior at this point than it is just, uh, uh, I think a, a much more sort of natural organic behavior that is not, not going to revert back to the way it was. Ever. Yeah. I, I wonder about the demographics of it a little bit as well. Like the, you know, I had to teach my mom how to do grocery shopping online. Now she likes it, you know, yeah. um, it's, she probably never would have done that, you know, ever. Yep. So there's a little bit of a, just like forcing people to adopt it. And then the familiarity and, and all of that, um, starts to come into effect. Um, I, I, that's probably not something you see in the data. I don't know. Maybe you do. Do you, do, do, is there a breakdown in demographics that you see? We don't really see that level of demographic data. Um, it's just not provided uh, by Amazon. But I mean, I think that anecdote is meaningful because I have experienced that as well with, with people that never shopped online. Now, all of a sudden, buy all their groceries on Instacart or buy everything on Amazon that they used to buy at Best Buy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, that that's not going to, it's just, it's not going to go backwards. People aren't clamoring for the day that they can go back to target. Like I just don't, you know, maybe some people, I don't want to say, I don't want to say no one's in that camp, but here, here's another thing that I'll mention that's less like theory and more, um, 
uh, historic precedent. So mm-hmm. uh, take kind of a, a, a minute to explain this, but I think it's meaningful. So Amazon uh, historically has understood that when people go through big lifestyle changes, uh, their shopping behavior changes, and oftentimes that change is very sticky. So um, specifically when they start college, when they start their first job, when they move, when they get married, when they have their first child. Those are big life-changing events, right? And when you do something like have your first child, you change your shopping behavior because you realize, uh, you know, it's actually way easier to get stuff shipped to me, uh, you know, online than it is to go to the store. So that's why when you look at these different programs, Amazon's built, Amazon Family, it used to be Amazon Mom, Amazon Student, it's very specifically catering to these people going through these lifestyle changes and basically trying to get them locked into a Prime membership. Um, Now, those are things that people want to do. They're choosing to go through these lifestyle changes. But COVID and it's kind of what it's done to force people into a different lifestyle, uh, different behavioral changes, I believe will have just as much of a stickiness effect as these other lifestyle changes do. Um, to me, it's, it's actually no different uh, than once you're sort of forced to buy everything online because you have a new baby and you can't go to the store. Uh, and then you just do that forever. One, mm-hmm. you with 15 year olds and you're still doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't see that as any different the, the reason is different, but the end result is going to be exactly the same. In my yeah. Opinion. Yeah. I, I would bet the same way. Um, I mean, we'll truly know once the masks come off and if there's a vaccine or any of that kind of a thing, but it's, it, it's certainly, there's a lot of things pointing in that direction. Um, you know, we were going to, I think, stop sharing the screen. How's your video? Is it working at all? You know, I'm, I'm, uh, it's just telling me it won't, it won't, failed to start video camera. I don't know. It's a settings thing. So let me mess around with it for two seconds. Here. Sure. Otherwise we can just keep going. We did get the poll back and I'll just maybe run through the numbers. Uh, hopefully you're not too distracted with uh, tech problems, but um, this was, uh, you know, how much gross annual sales revenue are you doing? So we've got, if you combine the, I'm new to Amazon zero and the other zero, which is I don't sell products suitable for Amazon. It's about 40%. Um, then we've got under 1 million at 31%, 1 to 10 million at 19%, and 10 million plus at eight. So got another 60 or so percent there um, who are doing business on there. So it's, it's kind of across the board, but it looks like the, the hot spot is in the under 1 million category. Um, lion's share, but not a majority. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of a good, a good mix. So that's, that's interesting. Um, is that kind of reflect your... Uh, I, I don't know how your clients, I mean, do you have a kind of a long tail with your clients or is it, are you dealing a lot with bigger clients or how does it work? No, you know, we have a pretty good distribution actually of, of, uh, you know, kind of disruptor, new brands, smaller brands, uh, a lot of mid market clients. And then, uh, certainly we have large enterprise clients, you know, so we have, we have clients doing from, you know, just started doing a couple hundred grand a year on Amazon up to, you know, over, um, well, this point, uh, nine figure, I guess, so over a hundred yeah. million a year right. on the platform. Um, all right. So I had a couple of questions for you. Um, we covered, I mean, we were kind of riffing there, so we covered a few of them, uh, in some ways, but the first one was what's different about 2020 prime day and Q4 versus previous years. We did talk a lot, um, about that. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add, uh, I, we could certainly cover it now, but I, I feel like we covered a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, in in terms of Prime Day, so this kind of early start to Q4 concept, I think is important. Um, You know, the other thing I would mention is that uh, there is a decent likelihood this year that Amazon, because of the confluence of Prime Day being very close, well, being in Q4 and very close to peak, which is Black Friday, plus the massive shift we talked about, consumer behavior shifting online, could cause the system to break to some degree. So when I say break, I don't mean like no one's going to be able to shop on Amazon for a week. But what I mean is from the brand perspective, historically, you've been able to to rely pretty much 10 out of 10 times on Amazon fulfillment, Amazon logistics to get the job done. Uh, There's a decent likelihood that uh, Amazon will not be able to fulfill all of the demand on their platform. 
and that they will have to triage product. They will have to say, we'd rather bring enough PlayStation 5s in to fill demand than, than we will uh, socks. So if you're selling socks, you may get bumped. You may not be able to send inventory in. Um, so there's real uh, uh, kind of physical limitations of Amazon system, even though it's hundreds of millions of square feet, even that at some point gets maxed out and they can't just, you know, build a new fulfillment center in a day. Mm -hmm. like they can with some of the more kind of uh, technical constraints that they face. So, um, so my advice there would be uh, uh, make sure that you have as much of a distributed approach to fulfillment as possible, because you may have to intentionally circumvent Amazon's fulfillment network to get product to the customer when they want it this Q4. Okay. That's uh, I hope everyone's listening to that. That could, that could be pretty key. Yeah. Um, let me go back to um, screen share for a second here. Um, so this question is uh, how will Q4 e-commerce strategy impact 2021? So, you know, this gets into the kind of the heart of the matter here of like, you know, sure Q4 is going to be big, but it's not going to be like any other year. Or so, you know, take advantage of it. But it, this speaks to the customer loyalty question of um, how you help your clients um, gain customer loyalty on Amazon. And to me, you know, it's like I, for some of those people, maybe their loyalty is to Amazon. So how do you help the clients stand out? I think that's probably the key question. Yeah. So um, there is a lot of loyalty to the Amazon platform among consumers, but oftentimes, you know, I don't think of it as kind of a zero sum game. I think of it maybe as like concentric circles, right? So you can have a customer that's very Amazon loyal, but then within that they're loyal to a brand or a subset of brands within different categories on the platform. Um, so that's very much something that, that you should be aiming for is, is customer loyalty within Amazon. And of course, you know, externally as well. Um, there are a lot of very specific functional elements of the Amazon platform that, uh, that are geared towards encouraging repeat purchases. Amazon knows that a customer is much more likely to purchase a brand that they've already had a good experience with than they are to purchase a brand new product that they've never heard of. Now, of course, they do both, but um, there are uh, programs like Subscribe and Save, um, which is a, a, a brand funded program to encourage repeat purchases with a discount. Yep. But then there's a lot of more sort of um, just organic functionality of the platform. Um, so Amazon, if, if anyone is paid attention when they're shopping on the platform, what you'll realize is any product that's a consumable that you've purchased before, Amazon's going to constantly message you with, do you need to order this again? Have you seen, you know, other products from this brand? Uh, do, like, do you need more of this through email, through, through, uh, through the mobile app, through the desktop experience? So, um, so what you should be doing then as a brand is really attempting to uh, get as many new customers engaged with your product on the platform as possible, knowing that from there, the platform will sort of automatically message them to repeat purchase. Now, of course, you can do more proactive things with advertising, marketing, et cetera, to encourage that. But you know, to zoom out, really, what I'm ultimately talking about here is, uh, is what's referred to as, uh, as the Amazon flywheel. So the more success you have, the more success you will then have. Um, and so this Q4, of course, is important to drive sales in Q4, but it also in a very real functional way sets up next year. Um, so I, I think sometimes there's this fluffy, oh, well, sure, like if you do well, you're going to do well in the future but I mean very literally deliberately functionality of the platform that's been yeah. built um, to uh, encourage purchasing of more product that has already been uh, purchased. It, it's built to do that. Success begets success. You're saying Amazon, it, 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 it helps you be more successful as you are successful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very, very deliberate. You know, I when see. customers vote with their, with their wallet um, and buy something, it is a very strong indicator that they will buy it again and other customers like them will also want to buy that product. So. Right. So the algorithm favors you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so getting a little bit more into kind of the weeds of it, um, what are the opportunities to capture market share? Like are the tools um, that are available when you're assessing your competition and you're trying to zig when they're zagging, that kind of thing? 
Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, Amazon is really a much more democratized level playing field than any other retail experience. Um, You know, you are in, in theory, uh, if you're a, you know, startup uh, laundry detergent brand, you have the same access to the same stuff that Tide has. Um, So they're, you know, of course they have a bigger budget and they have more brand affinity, but the, the platform is truly democratized. So uh, what that means is, uh, capturing share is a much more sort of achievable thing if you're a savvy brand on the platform. The biggest driver uh, that brands are going to have uh, is, um, is really advertising. So we want to make sure that what, w- what we call, um, what Amazon calls uh, retail ready is set up on all the products. So that means they're in stock, they have the right price, they have good uh, high quality basic and enhanced content. Those are kind of like table stakes. You have to get those done. But from there, then it really becomes a game of both um, organic and paid traffic. So you want to do everything you can uh, to encourage organic traffic through good SEO practices um, and some other practices uh, that that enhance relevancy. And then you really want to focus uh, a lot of your effort on deploying uh, a budget uh, in Amazon's advertising uh, platforms. There's two of them. There's search and there's display to basically capture as many uh, net new customers as you can that not only sells product directly, um, but it also then directly uh, and indirectly influences the organic search ranking. So unlike other search engines where they're sort of separated, you know, you can run AdWords on Google and then there's Google SEO and those things are, they don't really directly impact one another. On Amazon, they do. So the more that you spend on advertising, the higher your product will rank in organic uh, uh, relevancy on the platform. See? So that's, that's a really important thing to understand because there's a second order effect, and this is all about capturing share at the mm-hmm. end. There's a second order effect that really comes into play, and the brands that punch above their weight are the ones that understand uh, that dynamic. Hmm. Okay. Um, we're running a little short on time, so I want to jump to the next question about fostering customer loyalty because um, yeah, this is how it's going to impact them into next year. Um, and I think you covered a lot of this, uh, so maybe we don't need to address this, but, um, but if you have anything to add here, please. Yeah, two um, super s- sort of tactical things, uh, and I'll just go, go through them very quickly. One, make sure you're responding to every customer. Every review, every customer question should get a response from you as the brand. Something your customer service team should be able to handle. Don't need to overthink it, but just like you'd respond to any other customer, you know, calling you or emailing you, do that on the platform. Not only is that customer going to be happier, but other people, other shoppers see that interaction because it's all visible. Mm -hmm. Um, Number two, if you're a seller, uh, so on the marketplace side of things, um, you should, within Amazon's rules, uh, make sure that you're properly communicating via email um, through the kind of Amazon sanctioned channels with your customers and dealing with any customer service issues immediately. So, um, you know, two very simple tactical things, but I would layer those on top of my other comments. And is the, is, as a marketplace seller, is there um, tools for kind of branding yourself on there, creating a presence for yourself, or does Amazon keep it pretty egalitarian? Um, it's pretty limited. Uh, so, you know, once a customer purchases your product, you do have a limited ability to communicate with them. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, other than that, it's really going to be more brand and product focused than it is going to be like seller focused, if you will. Right. Um, like, I don't know, even if Mondelez wants to go up there or something like that, I mean, can they put a big splash page that has Oreos and Ritz and all that stuff? Or is that, is, yeah. is that limited? So yes. So the, the best way to do that is, is called uh, the Amazon brand store. And this is actually something we're pretty bullish on because Amazon's putting a lot of resources into it and improving the experience really over a week at this point. So brand store, the best way to think of it, it's basically like your direct to consumer site experience within Amazon. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's going to be amazon.com backslash Oreo. You go there and you just have a, you know, a locked into Oreo experience. And it's completely up to that brand um, to, uh, to, you know, curate and build out that experience. Wanted to get to audience questions and we are running a little bit late. So I think uh, we just now is a good time to do 
that. Um, I think I saw a couple come in. Do you see those two, yeah. uh, John? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll address the first one first, uh, which is a, a, a something that's actually come up a lot um, in the media, in, in Congress. Um, so basically, so some of the small business owners, uh, basically they, they want to sell a product on Amazon, um, but they're afraid Amazon is going to knock them off uh, with an Amazon private label brand. Um, what do they do to protect themselves? Um, you do what you would do in any other open free market, which is you build a brand and then you protect that brand and that product innovation with IP. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there's obviously, um, there's patents, there's trademarks, there's copyrights. I would use those things. I would not expect that if you build a product that is, um, not, uh, how do I say this? If you build a product and it's not protected by IP, uh, Amazon is well within their rights to create a private label version of that product. I know it doesn't seem fair. I don't disagree with that. Um, but it is what it is. You know, you, you, you sell a product into Target, you sell a product into Walmart, into Kroger, into Costco. They're all going to do the same thing. They're all going to potentially build a private label version. Um, that's been retail for the last 30 years. Amazon is no different. Um, now, what I will say is Amazon only really builds private label versions of top selling products. So if that's something that you're facing as a risk, it's kind of a high quality problem in a way, right? Because you've built a multi-million dollar product. Also, Amazon tends to only create a version of like a single, uh, a couple SKUs in a category. So if you have, you know, what you should do, be doing is creating a, a greater breadth of product, uh, 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 more innovation, you know, more newness. A small company can innovate in a category much faster than Amazon private label can. So um, it is a risk. It is a competitive threat, just like other brands are a competitive threat. Um, but I don't think uh, it should um, be enough of a factor to uh, cause anybody not to sell on the platform. Um, okay. Do you see another question in there that, uh, um, that is addressing? I've, I've got one. Actually, let me, let me ask you this one. Sure. Do, do small and medium-sized businesses tend to benefit the most from marketing on Amazon and how would large companies like CPGs or, or any company, I don't know, Ford, um, how would they use it? And are these two different strategies or is it basically the same? Um, you know, I lost you. Adam, I, uh, I was going to let you know that, you know, if, if you'd like me to jump in, this is Garrett from the Worker Pacific team. Uh, I'm here in the background. I could help answer some questions if we want to get to those or, yeah. Uh, well, let's, you know, we're, we're kind of running over anyway, but like he, since we asked that question about small to medium sized businesses and the strategies between enterprise and small to medium, you're, you're like a hero, Garrett, jump on in. Yeah, yeah, sure. So really, um, and hi everybody, my name is Garrett. I'm with the Orca Pacific team here. Um, when you're really looking at the difference between a small business and an enterprise business on Amazon, it's really, you have equal opportunity on either side because Amazon's really set up so that if you pull the right levers at the right time, you can start turning that flywheel in your favor, regardless of whether you have a big brand name behind you. And some of the things mentioned previously about how Amazon doesn't give a whole lot of opportunities for brands to make their brand equity show on the platform. It really actually opens a window for smaller disruptor brands to be able to step into the platform and make an impact. So really when you're a small brand, what you can do well is leverage your nimbleness, right? If you're a small brand, you likely have a lot less red tape. You can move quicker. So oftentimes making sure that you are looking into what's on the cut, what's on the cutting edge of Amazon, what beta programs are out there, what different opportunities are there with content on your brand store, on your product detail page. There's constantly new, exciting stuff happening on the Amazon platform. And oftentimes those bigger, larger legacy brands don't have the ability to be able to move quickly and adapt and change their strategy to adjust. So if you're a small brand, my advice would be look at every single new exciting thing Amazon platform is doing and just jump right into it. Start getting involved. It's also a great way to, you know, get your name really heard in the Amazon team. So then when you start to, you know, build a relationship with Amazon as a small brand, they start to see you as an early adopter of these programs. And the next thing you know, you're starting to be invited to these betas that are invite only. 
Um, so that's a really good strategy for small brands. And then to keep it short, with, if you're a big legacy brand, oftentimes big legacy brands have an issue getting budgets approved through their C-suite because oftentimes those C-suites and those big legacy brands don't fully understand what the opportunity is on the Amazon platform, especially because it's so different than that brick and mortar of strategy. So if you're a legacy brand, it's going to be really about bringing everybody into the room. Make sure you have your C-suite, make sure you have everyone bought in because if you don't have those upper, you know, uh, people that are vertical of you in the room when you're making those e-commerce decisions, you're not likely to get that buy-in when it comes to, you know, increasing your ad spend or trying programmatic or testing new things. So that's sort of my advice for small and big brands. Hey guys, um, I'm back on audio at least, Garrett. I think that was really well said. I got the end of it. So it's exactly uh, what I would have said. Awesome. Sorry about all the uh, technical issues. No problem. We're adapting. Um, all right, listen, guys, I'm going to close it up, but we do, there are some more questions and I think best thing to do Garrett and John is to, is to maybe, um, answer those questions directly to those people after the webinar is over just via email. Cause we have their email addresses and that kind of thing. So we will leave no question unanswered. Um, so listen, uh, we'll close it up. Thanks. Uh, you know, to everyone today, John Garrett, thanks for jumping in. Um, and if you want to reach out to John, this is his uh, LinkedIn address. As I mentioned, we'll have the slides and the recording available uh, as well. And all of these other links we've already sent to you in the chat as well. Um, so we really appreciate it. And we'll get to all of your questions as well. We thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time on Live with Mighty High.